We are now live on Facebook and I will just pass over to my colleague Alina Breckman, the Director of EU Affairs at B'nai B'rit International. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it's great to have you with us, whether you are watching us on Facebook or on Zoom, I hope you're all well and healthy and still staying at home. Uh, my name is Alina Brickman. As my colleague Ilan said, I'm the Director of EU Affairs of the Neighborhood International. Um, for those of you that we didn't yet get to work with before, the Neighborhood International is a Jewish advocacy and service organization um, working on ensuring Jewish life around the world, combating anti-Semitism, but also working collaboratively with other communities. So in that spirit, we're really excited to be partnering on this event with the European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity Intergroup um, for what is surely a very timely conversation about how minorities are specifically impacted by the current pandemic. Um, perhaps a word on why this event was relevant for the Neighbors International. Um, very early on, we witnessed in the Jewish community a very clear and particular impact beyond what uh, society as a whole was experiencing. We saw a rise in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. We saw a rise in uh, violent incidents, as well as a very sharp disturbance to Jewish ritual life and communal life more broadly. We also saw a lot of mobilization within the community. And in the same sense, we understood that other minority communities are confronting their unique challenges. So we thought that offering a platform for exchange and hearing from all the different communities represented here today would lead to more effective policy making as well as mutual learning. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from all the speakers that are with us here today, both policy makers and civil society. And uh, I'm again incredibly pleased to be doing this event together with Ardi. So on that note, I pass the floor to Yelena Jovanovic, who is the coordinator of Ardi. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I would also like to say that I'm so happy with our cooperation and that I'm already hoping that we will co-organize more events in the future with Bernay Brit International and with you. I would also like to welcome you, our participants, and also those who follow us live on Facebook and Zoom. Thank you all for demonstrating uh, the need to discuss and to act together to fight racism. Uh, it is indeed encouraging to see that currently the main message of RD, that is racism is a COVID-19 urgency, is shared by many, many actors. Uh, the Zoom registration, as we heard, got filled in in no time, and uh, so many people expressed their interest to join us today and to start the discussion. Uh, I would also like to share with you uh, are the objectives, uh, specifically with regards to this event. Uh, we had basically two main objectives. One is uh, especially raising, one is raising a more awareness about the fact that uh, racism is increased. We have the situation where racism is increasing during the COVID-19 crisis. And the second objective would be basically to get more recommendations from different actors on how to continue to act and to make sure that nobody is left behind. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the first speaker. Uh, I would give the floor, I will give the floor to MAP Monica Silvana Gonzalez. Uh, MAP Gonzalez is a co-chair of Party and she's a member of Socialist and Democrats in the European Parliament. Uh, MAP Gonzalez, please take the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to host this discussion together with my colleague NEP France. Uh, dear Commissioner Dali, uh, Mr. Flaherty, civil society representative and, and, and listening. Uh, there are not regular time. We are living through a global crisis. Uh, this is a serious health crisis, but everybody must understand that it affects very different areas and aspects of our lives. 
it does not only negatively impact economic of the member states, but our society in all its complexity. And unfortunately, the number of manifestation of racism and xenophobia in crisis during this crisis, social inequalities became more visible. Moreover, watching the development of political party which suits racist, xenophobic and exclusive with any kind of diversity speeches. In Spain case, this is box, but there are many more in the rest of Europe. As for example, National Front or Alternative for Germany, uh, ATTs. Uh, that is the reason why we should be more active and work together to face them. Let me repeat uh, this in Spanish, uh, please. Uh, es muy, muy importante que los partidos, los grupos, las fuerzas políticas que defendemos el luchar contra la discriminación nos unamos para combatir esta lacra que es el racismo y la xenofobia que en tiempos de crisis se se, se ceba. En España estamos sufriendo mucho el caso de Vox, de un partido de ultraderecha que contamina el discurso político y se suman también los otros partidos como, como son de los otros partidos que contaminan el, el discurso. Por lo tanto, es muy importante luchar juntos. Continúo en uh, in, in inglés. This point might sound like stunting the obvious. However, the fact in, the, in that many important actors ignore the obvious, and this is why we have to reflect on this more and create stronger alliances. I am therefore very glad to have all of you here. I would like to express my gratitude to Commissioner Elena Lali uh, for providing her com commitment in such a short period of time for working hard every day to mitigate the impact of the crisis on different marginal communities. I am a co-president of RD while also chairing the disability intergroup. There we held discussion about the impact of the crisis on people with disability. Their situation is also much more difficult now we can only imagine consequence of the crisis on a person with disability at the same time experience racism, racism or xenophobia. We can, uh, we can leave anybody behind. This is why I prefer looking into the problem for an intersectional approach and I urgence all the actor not to forget about any discrimination group, especially, especially not now. I am thankful to Mr. Flaherty, director of the Fundamental Rights Agencies, for joining us today and yet again demonstrated the FRE commitment to define again racism and xenophobia. I would like to emphasize that your recent report on the impact of the current crisis on fundamental rights have already been used by the anti-racist and diversity interrupt work. And I know that your work is incredibly important for many different people, institutions and organizations. I also incredibly honor to hear from the civil society. Advocate represent her today, and I wish to offer my support to you in fighting our joint path. Thank you, thank you, uh, Jeff uh, Wasinclain, uh, EOTO, and thank you, Isabella Mihalache, the uh, ERGO Network, and Benjamin Steinit, the ERA. IES and Habib El Hajiji, the Collect Collection Center Islamophobic in Belgium. And thank you, uh, Alina Brickman and Helena Kanobobis, coordinator of Anti Racism and Diversity Intergroup and director and affair by being international. Thank you for organizing this, this event. 
regarding of the fact that many actors are in the process of col collecting data on case of racism in the fact of COVID crisis. I would like to stress out that this discussion is timely and very important. We must not wait until we have the full picture because firstly, we very well know that this, the cases of racism are not being reported. And secondly, say civil society has not been supported sufficiently to monitor the situation. This is another reason why I am glad to hear from advocates from different communities who are actively regardless the challenges. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, experience and recommendation. I warning we call all the participants. Sorry for my bad, bad English and if uh, uh, there are any question, please, my assistant Daniel translate uh, translate you. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Amity Gonzalez, for your remarks and also for your team uh, uh, to to help with translation. Uh, it is now my pleasure to give the floor to MAP Romeo Franz, who is also a co-chair of Party and a member of Greece in the European Parliament. Uh, MAP Franz, please take the floor. Thank you, Yelena. Hello, all together. I'm happy to see you here. Thank you very much for an introduction. As my colleague stated, it is a high time that we come together and hear from each other in spite of challenges. As I said numerous times, increase of racism and the fact that people of Romani background and other communities now suffer, disproportionality cannot be ignored. People of Romani, Asian, African and Middle East descent, Jewish people, undocumented people and asylum seekers especially experience scapegoating and hate speech, including hate speech by politicians. There are also reports of enforcement of racist policies, increase of attacks, racial profiling and police brutality, even more difficult access to education and increased final insecurity, as well as total. It is especially worrying that Roma in Europe still lack access to clean water. While one of the most important advice of professionals is wash your hands. I assure you that you that I am giving my best to not only spread awareness of the situation, but also act so we can create as favorable conditions as possible for the actors on the ground to protect the communities. I also would like to join my colleague Monica in welcoming you all. Some of you have seen that we work very closely with Commissioner Dali. She is a great ally and we act together to push governments to do something about the situation. It's been enough of statements. We are working. We are making COVID related policies and measures responsive to the situation of the most marginalized. I warmly welcome Mr. O'Flaherty. It is so important to have your institution that is responding so quickly and effectively to the crisis as part of this discussion. It is now of utmost importance that we help the governments actually follow your recommendations, recommendations of civil society and other important actors. Now it is time for the governments to, to show respect for all governments, including the governments of the accession and neighboring countries need to act now to protect all, to protect all people. They are still mostly silent. And this is dangerous because 
Some individuals, groups, far-right parties are using the crisis to further stigmatize already stigmatized communities to fill hatred and even to frighten people. I'm very concerned and disturbed by the situation, but I will continue to fight with help of civil society organizations too. Thank you for sharing your recommendations with us and for being here. One thing I would like to share with you, I would like to see more awareness of institutional racism and its consequences. More of us have to understand that we cannot only strive to make good policies, we cannot just strive to make it clear that the money should also go to the most marginalized, for example. We have to constantly check if this is happening or not. And for this, we have to support those who monitor the situation on the ground. This is too a COVID-19 emergency. We should all be deeply concerned about who gets help and who doesn't. And we must communicate about this and act accordingly. Let's work on this together too. Thank you, my colleagues. Thank you, MEP Gonzalez and MEP Front. Um, we take note of your important remarks. Uh, MEP Gonzalez, you spoke of um, the negative influence of far right parties and the xenophobia that they stoke but also the importance of allyship, um, as well as of reporting and monitoring on the more concrete side. Um, MEP France, you spoke about um, the disproportional effect on minorities that COVID has had, but also the issues around scapegoating and hate speech and the importance of um, addressing institutional um, racism. Um, so thank you very much for that. And we will reflect on these remarks in the civil society panel. That said, it is my pleasure to give the floor to, uh, to our first keynote speaker, uh, Commissioner for Equality, Helena Dali. Uh, Commissioner Dali has been really incredibly present as has been already been said um, a few times, um, both before the crisis began, but also uh, during the crisis, I think uh, all of us civil society organizations really appreciate um, your approach and your active engagement. Thank you so much for being with us today and for your engagement throughout this period. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Uh, I thank RD and Nybrit International for the kind invitation to address this, this meeting today. We are living in extraordinary times and the COVID-19 pandemic is challenging our union's resilience like no crisis before. Over the past weeks, EU governments have had to take emergency measures to address the health crisis caused by the pandemic. In coordinating the common European response, the European Commission is taking resolute action to reinforce our public health sectors and mitigate the socio-economic impact in the EU. We are not only facing a health crisis. The crisis is exacerbating pre-existing racial and structural inequalities in our society with far-reaching consequences they may, that may have an impact well beyond the end of the pandemic. So due to stereotypes and racial discrimination, people from minority backgrounds are encountering additional challenges. As you know, uh, together with Commissioner Schmidt and Kiriakides, I sent a letter to ministers in member states emphasizing the need for specific measures for vulnerable groups. The letter recommended to governments to ensure wide dissemination of information on the current crisis to both ethnic minorities and the majority of the population. We obviously need to avoid hate from spreading further. 
In parallel, we have initiated a dialogue with member states on how to better address the specific needs of the most vulnerable groups, in particular, those of the Roma communities. Based on the information from the national Roma contact points in various member states, authorities are providing support for emergency measures of an informative and preventive nature in collaboration with Roma NGOs. We also drew member states' attention to the funds available under the Corona Response Investment Initiative and the Corona Response Investment Initiative, also the Coronavirus uh, uh, Initiative Plus, which enable the, the rapid mobilization of avail available allocations under the European Structural and Investment Funds and the Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived. Member states should provide safeguards to all people, including disadvantaged groups, mostly I would say to the disadvantaged groups, who are in need of this particular support. I am determined to put forward a reformed and strengthened post-2020 strategic framework for Roma equality, inclusion, and participation, which will also reflect the new needs emerging in the coronavirus crisis among marginalized Roma communities. So we will feed all that we are analyzing right now and learning and, and studying about the situations. The, all this will be fed in, in, into our uh, work, which, will be shall, which we shall be presenting uh, by the end of this year. So incidents of racism, xenophobia, and intolerance targeting minorities have been observed, and as you have rightly said before me, uh, have been observed in most EU member states. Europeans of Asian descent or being perceived as Asian have encountered racial abuse and attacks in many EU countries. We cannot accept any scapegoating and xenophobia, and we should publicly condemn and sanction such racist acts. European legislation, such as the framework decision on racism and xenophobia, provides the basis for member states to act. It has been a key priority for the EU to ensure the correct transposition and implementation of this legislation to protect ethnic and national minorities. This time of crisis makes it even more important to apply the legislation correctly. We have developed tools to assist member states in strengthening the practical response against hate speech and hate crime. Online disinformation based on conspiracies is skyrocketing and undermines trust in national and international structures. Anti-Semitism conspiracies, which try to scapegoat Jewish communities, are reminiscent of Black Death conspiracies during the medieval ages. 30% more anti-Semitic online content was detected compared to before the crisis. And we are concerned that these conspiracies are seen in the past in, in Christchurch, as seen in the past in, in Christchurch, in Hell and in Hanau, will lead after the confinement to violence against minorities. The Commission will continue to monitor the implementation of the Code of Conduct on countering illegal hate speech. The results will inform the ongoing reflections on possible further measures to address illegal contact, content online in the Digital Services Act. Rather than scapegoating minority communities, we should be celebrating the vital role which they play in carrying out frontline work in the health sector and other essential jobs on which society depends. I also want to express my gratitude to faith communities who had to celebrate their festivities under confinement. 
Ramadan, Pesach, and Easter had to take place in unusual settings with families and, and communities this year. So I fully understand the effect that social distancing from family, friends, and communities means at all times, but especially in these particular instances. It is essential to ensure sure. that the most vulnerable will not disproportionately carry the burden of this disease. It is what I, together with my team, am working for. We will work closely with you, honorable members of parliament, and with member states and with stakeholders to monitor closely the crisis and to give the most adequate responses to make sure that no one is left behind. I thank you for this. I shall, I shall follow uh, the discussion, and, uh, but I will switch off my camera because it, uh, I don't have a very good reception here at the Berlimont. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Gali. Indeed, uh, as Alina also mentioned, we very much appreciate your active engagement, especially during the crisis, during this period. And uh, we also look forward to your reflections on the civil society panel a little bit later. Uh, it is now my pleasure to give the floor to our second keynote speaker. Uh, we are uh, thrilled to have with us today Director of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, Mr. Monica O'Flaherty. Our Fundamental Rights Agency has been documenting COVID-19 issues uh, faced by minorities, and we very much look forward to hearing uh, more uh, about the results of your work. Director O'Flaherty, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And let me express appreci appreciation to B'nai B'rith and to Ardi for taking the initiative of this meeting. I have to begin, I'm afraid, by agreeing with everybody who has already spoken that we're not speaking of racism and discrimination as a risk in the time of COVID, but as a serious and growing reality. We know that here at the Fundamental Rights Agency from our work across the 27 member states. We have research teams in every member state and we're chronicling day by day, month by month, the human and fundamental rights implications of COVID uh, and the public health and other responses. We contain these in bulletins, which we issue publicly every month. The first one last month, the next one later in May. But what are we seeing? Uh, we're seeing particular minority groups uh, experiencing uh, uh, particularly worrying challenges. Roma have been mentioned already, but they must be mentioned again. Roma in many places in Europe are being blamed for the virus. They're subject to draconian lockdown when the virus is detected in their communities. Lockdowns which would be frankly unacceptable in the general population. We have far too many reports of discriminatory profiling by police of Roma in the context of policing the lockdowns. And when, when one explores the issue of intersectionality, we see some very serious problems with Roma. For example, the intersectionality of poverty and being a member of the Roma community. Uh, we already heard from MEP France about the issue of hygiene and washing hands and lack of running water in so many facilities. Uh, but there's also the issue of children away from school relying on distance learning when they don't have a Wi-Fi signal. Turning to another group that's particularly hard hit, that of migrants, particularly those who have arrived recently. Uh, many of the issues I've just described are no less relevant there, but I would add as particularly worrying situations, the closed borders, the inability to apply for asylum in, in too many locations, and the reports of pushbacks in some places. We also have the well-recorded risks in closed reception facilities. And it's not just the risk of contracting the virus, it's also the risks that, uh, that are faced by certain migrants within these communities. For example, migrants who have to be forced to live in a hostile environment, such as those who self-identify as LGBTI and who are forced to live with people who find their lifestyle or their reality unacceptable. 
The situation of the Jewish community has already been mentioned and it needs to be flagged again. Uh, here at the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, frankly, we were appalled when we read the recent very good report of the World Jewish Congress regarding what they are detecting as patterns globally. And uh, Commissioner Daly has made reference just now to those perceived to be of Asian origin. And I would in particular point to those who are perceived to be of Chinese origin. Uh, I think the situation, while unacceptable, is, is, is relatively well known. There are two other groups who face discrimination that I would mention, even if it is not primarily a racial or ethnic discrimination, but nevertheless important to mention, including uh, through intersectionality. The first of these two is people with disabilities. Again here, we've got problems of people uh, facing uh, infection in institutions, but also in recent weeks, uh, we're getting reports of people with disabilities having great difficulty in some places uh, gaining access to goods, such as, for example, gaining access to shops where everybody is required to push a trolley. And then the last group I would mention is women. We must adopt a gendered approach to all analysis of racism, racism and discrimination in the context of COVID. The, uh, the, the very disturbing uh, incidence of violence against women has received some attention, but there are many other dimensions of where women uh, face a worse experience than men, such as, for example, in the supports given to essential staff in some places, uh, which focus on essential staff who have uh, somebody else at home to care for the children. But what does that say to the single parent, such as the single mother? Now, before moving on, I would just say that uh, we have to keep in mind in reporting on what's going on uh, in the context of COVID, as in uh, any other context, that we know as a fact across all groups that there is massive under-reporting of incidents of discrimination and violence, including on the basis of uh, actual or perceived ethnicity. So we have to assume uh, that we only have the tip of the iceberg in terms of the actual reality. And finally, in terms of the, the situation as we see it, uh, I would echo what Commissioner Daly said, uh, and I, I, I would recall the importance to look to the future and to the huge new challenges that are arising very quickly uh, over the horizon. And I'm thinking in particular today, for example, of the inevitable economic recession uh, and the related inequalities and discriminations uh, which, for which we must already be preparing. Now, what do we need to do? Let me wrap up with some specific action points. Uh, there will be eight of them, but I promise they'll be extremely brief. The first action point has to be to never forget and remind everybody that we're not talking here about good behavior, decent behavior, nice behavior. We're talking about law. Non-discrimination and equality are legal entitlements and legal duties, and we must insist on them in that frame. Second, we need to do a better job of auditing public health measures in order to assess their impact on minorities. These measures need to be audited in their design and in their rollout. That brings me to the third of my eight points, and that is in order to audit them in their rollout, in their implementation, we must gather disaggregated data. We must know the impact of public health and related measures uh, taking account of their distinct impact uh, uh, according to categories of ethnicity, nationality, disability, gender, and age. And we really have to get past this sense from some governments that there's somehow something wrong with very carefully and appropriately disaggregating in this fashion. If we don't measure it, we can't fix it. Fourth, we have to continue to invest in encouraging impacted people and communities to be willing to report their experience. Again, it's vitally important that we improve self-reporting to gain a sense of the scale of the problems we're confronting. I could make this point in any setting, but I have to reiterate it in this particular context. Fifth, and I think it's the point has already been made, we need our leaders, our political leaders, to make strong public statements that reject myths and call for solidarity across all of the component parts of our societies. 
and what we must absolutely consider intolerable are voices of leaders, as we have seen in some places, which actually feed into myth and hate. Sixth, where law is violated, then such violations must be investigated and prosecuted. Those who break the criminal laws in the context of hate uh, and, 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 and hate-related crimes must be held accountable. And as Commissioner Daly said, uh, it's so important that the relevant EU law be transposed and be implemented. And seventh, and, and indeed finally, uh, I would like to make a systemic point, which uh, it, it ranges right across all issues of the response to COVID-19, be it in the context of racism, discrimination or otherwise. And that is, we need to see far more human and fundamental rights expertise at the heart of decision making, above all else, at the national levels. We see many high level councils, government bodies, committees established. They comprise political leaders, medical leaders, security representatives, economists. I don't see enough human rights experts in there. Uh, this mix of expertise must include uh, uh, the expertise on human rights so that human rights can be restricted, respected. When they're restricted, they'd be done in compliance with the rules and the prohibition, the absolute prohibition on discrimination can be honored comprehensively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director of Flaherty. First of all, for, for joining to begin with. Um, it's been remarkable to see how much um, material FRA has been able to um, put out there um, within such a short period of time. I felt that there was an intense mobilization to address the effects of the COVID crisis. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a huge help for civil society as well. And I think it's created a sense of mobilization within civil society organizations to focus more in turn on reporting and really gathering information from the ground level. Um, I appreciate your action-oriented uh, remarks and we take them, we take note of them and uh, we will reflect on them during the civil society panel. Um, thank you so much for joining us. If you will be able to, to stay with us longer, we'd love to hear more reflections. If, if not, we would uh, collect all our points and um, send them your way and uh, hopefully continue this uh, discussion after the, the live panel. Um, that said, it's time to, to move on to those folks on the ground, the activists and the advocates really in close contact um, with the community. So we're going to um, now hear a little bit about the experience of the Roma community, the Black community, the Muslim community, and the Jewish community as seen by members of these communities. Um, and um, I will give the floor to Yelena to, to actually introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Alina. Uh, today we have four representatives of the civil society with us. Uh, Isabella Michalaki, she is a senior advocacy officer responsible for no discrimination, fundamental rights, and fighting anti gypsyism and European, at European Roma Grassroots Organizations Network, Ergo Network. Uh, this is a network of organizations from different EU countries and also from the Western Balkans, Turkey, and Ukraine. Uh, I will just make a note that uh, because Isabella has to go soon, um, uh, because of another important commitment. Uh, we will pose two questions to Isabella and um, uh, at the, right at the beginning. Uh, so, uh, would you like to first share with us a situation on the ground? So, to tell us a little bit more about the state of art and then also let us hear your take on the policy responses. Uh, Isabella, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, and thank you very much for this great opportunity to really address this honorable panel today on the situation of Roma communities. And I would really like to salute the speakers before me, the MEPs, um, Monica Silvana, MEP Romeo of France, Commissioner Dali and Mikael um, of Laherty for really uh, looking so deeply into the situation of all racialized communities and mentioning that Roma do need to be spoken about more. 
And indeed, while there is such a, a lack of data at this point on the impact of COVID-19, reports that we have clearly indicate that there is a disproportionate impact, negative impact of both the pandemic, but also of the security measures that come with it on the 12 Roma, um, million Roma plus uh, within um, member states enlargement, but also neighborhood countries that are aggravated by long systemic discrimination and anti-Gypsism. As it has been already mentioned, most Roma live in precarious conditions and cannot really observe the social distancing and protect themselves from getting the virus because of the lack of access to water and sanitation, which are basic services. This is even harder when we speak about Roma who are homeless or those that are living in segregated illegal or compact settlements or halting sites in the case of, of travelers or overcrowded homes. Numerous Roma communities have limited or no food supplies or medical provisions during the confinement, which additionally worsens their health status and increases their vulnerability to the pandemic. What is important to also mention is that the elderly and Roma over 45 years old are also a vulnerable category. This age category, it's an important reference as the lifespan of Roma across Europe is to up to 10 or even 15 years lower than the majority population. So therefore earlier delivery and preventive plan is essential to prevent health complications and deaths among Roma. Roma children have been already mentioned to be particularly affected, especially those living in rural areas and in settlements who have no access to internet, to computers or other electronic devices. And in some cases, even electricity to be able to really be part of this distance learning. In employment, there are many Roma that are working in the informal sector who lost their sources of daily income, particularly those who are even in the fields as daily workers or those who are collecting and selling scrap metal, those that are doing small trades, the market sellers, cleaners. Um, for instance, in Spain, I take the opportunity to say that most Roma work in flea markets. Um, and within this, Roma women and single mothers are particularly affected. Um, they are the most affected by the lockdowns because they cannot receive the social benefits. And we should also be aware of the fact that for the last years, local authorities have been cutting social benefits to Roma, which renders them now even more vulnerable. Unfortunately, measures of confinement and quarantine have disproportionately impacted Roma who are living in poverty and those who are in the informal economy who are stuck at home with limited resources and savings. In many of the situations, Roma who were placed in quarantine um, were not provided with food, water and sanitary equipment by the authorities. And that, and in this way, their lives and health were put at risk. The most even worrisome, which was already mentioned by Romeo Franz and also by the Frau representative, is that during the pandemic, we have seen a huge increase in the stigmatization and scapegoating of Roma for allegedly spreading the coronavirus. Negative statements from media and politicians contributed greatly to feeling negative prejudices and anti-Gypsism by ethnicizing cases of failure to follow security measures or by reporting about violent conflicts in Roma communities. In the past two months, we have seen really state representatives, police, journalists, public figures from Bulgaria to Romania, to Slovakia, to Spain, to Serbia and Ukraine that have used and propagated inflammatory rhetoric, labeled Roma as sources of coronavirus contamination. Even we have seen the local authorities have used targeted measures to confine Roma by creating checkpoints and employing extra police forces and even constabulary or military forces in countries such as Bulgaria, Slovakia and Romania to supervise and raid compact Roma communities. This has led in some occasions to disproportionate measures and racist violence against Roma, including women and, and children, which is, which is quite 
uh, quite serious. And as I have been given the possibility to continue with the second part, I would say that, um, and I would really want to congratulate myself, Commissioner Dali, for highlighting the importance of prioritizing the protection of fundamental rights and racialized minorities during COVID-19. But further guarantees are needed to ensure that all responses involved in the COVID-19 outbreak by governments and other state and non-state actors complied with EU and international human rights law and standards, and take into account the specific needs of marginalized groups and of those of risk, and that security and preventive measures during the pandemic are not disproportionate, are not illegitimate or discriminatory. Racist violence and intimidation, incidents of anti-Gypsism and police abuse should be rigorously investigated and sanctioned as well as the dissemination of misinformation, hate speech, and the scapegoating by, of Roma by the media, politicians, public figures, including for ethnicizing of crimes allegedly committed by Roma in the public discourse. And we have seen that the European Commission and the Parliament responded rapidly to the crisis with the Corona Response Investment Initiative Plus, the EU Solidarity Fund. Uh, however, we need to guarantee and not just declare that nobody is really left behind, which means that the EU has to ensure that the immediate humanitarian responses at European and national levels prioritize, coordinate, and allocate sufficient resources to vulnerable groups, in particular marginalized Roma communities and all racialized minorities, making sure that they are reached also in enlargement and neighborhood countries. Urgent measures must address um, the facilitations of to access to water, adequate sanitation, and electricity in Roma communities. Governments could provide immediate financial aid for lost employment to vulnerable groups working in the informal economy, such as the market sellers and daily workers I mentioned before, but also support the Roma students by providing supportive remote learning equipment and access to internet. A special provision for Roma should be included when implementing the European funding instruments for temporary support the SURE program, the FED program, and the Emergency Fund for Vulnerable Group Rights and Value program. However, and this is very important, the short-term humanitarian assistance will not be enough to overcome the deep structural problems the Roma communities are facing. The EU post-COVID-19 response should fully take into account the needs of vulnerable communities and ensure long-term investments in infrastructures, improved living conditions, smart and flexible economic uh, solutions in employment and entrepreneurship, quality education, a clean environments, fighting poverty and anti-Gypsism. As of now, throughout the midterm measures so that we can really vitally be contribute to solving the problems that Roman communities are facing. The adoption of the new framework strategy that was mentioned by Commissioner Dali must constitute a top priority in the COVID-19 response to the EU, member states and enlargement countries in order to comprehensively address all the structural problems that I have already mentioned. Many governments have already designed the strategies according to the EC guidelines and a delay in the adoption of such a strategy would mean that I uh, would mean to lose the alignment with the EU funding. The framework needs to include these minimum standards, the common indicators and joint monitoring and implementation through the European semester. The sustainable development goals, the European pillar of social rights, the new green deal and others need to take full account of Roma rights and inclusion in full coherence with the Europe, EU Roma strategic framework. And finally, I would say to everybody out there that we should all remember that the fight against the pandemic should bring us all closer together, not further apart. If one of us is vulnerable, then we are all vulnerable. COVID-19 is a test of humanity and we need to make sure that we will not fail at it for the sake of our future generations and even for the sake of life on this earth. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. And I wish you a very good conversation later on. Isabella, thank you very much for this really important message and also for the very comprehensive answer, including in regards to the policy needs and uh, especially, I mean, for, especially pointing out the both short-term 
and the long-term impact and the need for investments. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go uh, to, introdu to introduce another speaker from the civil society, I see that Mr. Franz wanted to say something only very shortly because he has to go for a very important uh, uh, Liber Committee meeting. So okay. if uh, Mr. Franz, you still have a minute, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I wish that the whole commission and the national governments would recognize the problem and the need for our minority policy in which equality opportunities, equal opportunities and the fight against racism are not only on paper, but are seriously implemented. And I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Now I must leave because I must go to Liebe and I wish you all the best and stay healthy. And I'm very happy to see you again. Bye bye, friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Franz. We wish you all the same. And uh, we will uh, inform you of the conclusions. Uh, our, our next speaker is Omar Bay. Uh, Omar is a historian and a well known activist. He's active in Belgium, but also throughout the EU. Uh, and he is a chairman of NPAT, the Belgian organization. Uh, this is a European network of people of African descent. Uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you for having me, for inviting me here. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my thoughts, first of all, uh, my thoughts go to, to all the victims of uh, COVID 19, this pandemic. And uh, especially um, to the elder people who have been victims, uh, not only of the pandemic, but also of dysfunctionment uh, in uh, health um, healthcare yeah, in general and um, other, other dysfunctionment. Um, I think it, has, it already has been said here that um, COVID-19, this pandemic uh, reveals existing uh, conditions, existing um, the structural uh, discriminations, uh, structural uh, exclusions mechanism. And uh, we saw it to, to, to give an image of it uh, in different countries, uh, by example, uh, concerning people of African descent and uh, African people from African origin in, in general, we see that uh, uh, many people uh, have been uh, extra controlled uh, by police or racial profiled. Uh, so uh, in, in, in areas where you have people, uh, where people, brown people and black people live, so you had more controls than in other area where, uh, uh, where non-brown people are living. So this was a fact. So this, for example, just to show that during the corona uh, pandemic and during the lockdown in some countries, you have you, 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 the same issues that were before were exaggerated these times by uh, extra use of force, extra use of, uh, of policing, and so on and so on. And uh, another fact, and uh, Mr. Mar uh, Mr. Flaherty uh, already uh, said it, uh, a community that is uh, often forgotten, migrants. Migrants, uh, not only they were racially profiled, but in a lot of European countries, they were just not protected. And uh, in the, among those migrants, you have a lot of people from, uh, from, from African origin, from African descent, from Eritrea, uh, Gambia, Nigeria, and, and, and other, other places. So those people, when, when we were obliging people to stay home to protect themselves for, from the virus, in some countries, they were just leaving those people outside exposed to the virus. So this crisis is not is for me not only an, a health cri a healthcare crisis, um, it's also a moral crisis. A moral crisis against some communities, and it highlights and it shows uh, how deep some problems are, especially the problems of uh, racism or of ex exclusions uh, towards some uncertain communities. Uh, another another fact also is that. Uh, which we're talking now about the pandemic and, and which was the impact of it. But we all know that uh, this health crisis comes also with an economic crisis. And uh, a lot of people are afraid that 
Now, uh, for many people of African descent, and I think that uh, the report of FRA has shown it, that uh, people of African descent are one of, in some countries, are one of the most discriminated people on the labor market, by example, uh, on housing, the housing market. And this will uh, increase if there is an economic crisis. They will, they will be more discriminated and uh, they will be more excluded. So you have a, a high risk of poverty among, uh, people, among people of African descent uh, uh, during the post COVID uh, uh, era, uh, I hope soon. So uh, these are issues that we, 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 are, we have been stressing a long time. And these are issues that are revealed themselves now during this crisis. And in different countries, by example, in Spain, you had uh, issues of, uh, of, of example, the, the example that was given about police, where you had police controlling uh, people just uh, getting out of their home and using violence. Uh, there are videos circulating about this. In France, the same things. In Belgium, even uh, I think that um, somebody who was working in the European Parliament was, uh, was racially profiled. Uh, and there was a video circulating about this. And I think um, it's somebody who was working for, for the green fraction. Eh? Uh, and, and, and just to show, this is, these are not legends, these are, these are no myths. These are not inventions from the civil society to say that there are problems, those problems really exist. They used to exist before and they exist, they are, they are, they are more present now than, than ever. So I think that, uh, like it has been said by, uh, by the other speakers, uh, now it's time to take real measures and sustainable measures uh, because these are, are, are issues we have been pointing for a long time and COVID only reveals what existed and uh, it made it worse. And with an economic crisis, it's going to be also, uh, also more severe again. So we need to implement measures and national act action plans against racism I mean, real action plans against racism, not only theoretical, uh, uh, theoretical framework, but real actions and the European Union should insist and, and, uh, on, on its members to implement uh, um, uh, real measures to tackle uh, exclusion uh, and, uh, and certain forms of discriminations and all of it. And I forgot because uh, like, uh, like Elena beautifully said, the, the, the speaker before me, uh, it's not only about talking about our own communities and, and how, how, it, how it goes wrong in our communities, but I think that when, we, when uh, um, something happened with the Romas, it happens, it, it's me that has been touched. When it happens with the Jewish people, it's the same as it, it happens to me. When it happens to the Muslim people, it's the same it, when it happens to me. I'm Muslim, by the way. But I mean, so it's just to say that uh, it's also important for us as a civil society to realize that the fragmentation of our movements, the fragmentation of our demands uh, makes us weaker. And it's important also that we, uh, we have to be more solid to join efforts, exchange practices, exchange strategies, and, uh, and make demands together and to oblige the European Union to, to implement some measures and to oblige countries also to implement some measures and not only particular measures. And, far right, uh, which is not sleeping, far right, which is still uh, vocal, tries to instrumentalize this crisis, this COVID crisis to, again, uh, to, for its own agenda. And, it, and, it, and the agenda of far right, we all know which agenda it is. It's, a, it's an agenda of racism, exclusion, and now uh, 75 years after the liberation of, uh, of Europe against the Nazi regime, uh, today still you have people using the same language against Muslims, against Roma, against people of African descent, and as they were using against, against Jewish people then. You know? So today, I think that, and today uh, uh, with this pandemic of, uh, of COVID-19, we see uh, on the internet uh, how uh, hate, uh, online hate speech uh, has increased. And almost uh, uh, people, are at ease at expressing certain things. And certain politicians are also, by, by insinuating certain things, uh, giving, a, giving, giving a, moral, a moral authorization to certain people to, to speak out on, uh, on, on certain communities, which is abject today, which, is, which should not be today. So uh, I think that uh, what, I was, what I want to say about this is to say that is, 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 is sad that some communities 
by facing also a health crisis, have to face discriminations, uh, have to face exclusion, and have to face uh, other kinds of humiliating uh, situations just because they have a different belief, just because they have a different color. And I want to insist also that the resolution voted by the European Union uh, uh, to implement uh, for uh, people of African descent, uh, realizing that some issues that, uh, that, that we were confronted 50, 100 years ago are still existing today of some consequences of it, it needs to be implemented. It, was a, it, was, it should not only be a declaration of good intentions, it should be implemented in a real framework uh, so that we can, of, on, a sustain, on a sustainable manner, tackle certain issues concerning people of African descent, that, uh, issues that they are facing until today, and issues that uh, I'm sure many of the communities are, are, are facing also. You know? So uh, I hope that with all the means that will be uh, released soon by the European Union, uh, Green Deal, uh, economical measures, uh, measures, all of those measures, that all those measures will be inclusive measures because racism brings poverty. Uh, racism brings other forms of exclusions. So it has to be really transversal. And in all those investments, uh, inclusion and, uh, um, and, and the respect of human rights should be underlined, should be stressed uh, always and all the time. So I want to close here and I, I with, with the second question, if, they, if there is, I will answer that one. Thank you very much, Omar, um, especially for uh, your uh, emphasis on sustainable solutions, because as you said, and many other participants uh, also pointed out, we cannot only think about the short-term impact. This is nothing new. It is just that now we see more acts, more manifestations of racism during the crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ajib El Ajaji. Is the, he is the vice president of the Belgian Collective Against Islamophobia. Uh, they work a lot with, those, with different governmental organizations, and especially with UNIA, which is the Belgian equality body, for example. And uh, their vision is to build an inclusive society based on human rights principles. Uh, Ajib, uh, I would like to give you the floor now to introduce the situation of uh, your communities and uh, also to talk uh, a little bit about the policy responses. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to apologize for the technical problem. Did you hear me now? Yes, okay. Um, thanks for Ilan, uh, the technical officer for Niper to help me for the, this technical problem. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Commissioner Dali for uh, her warming and very supporting message in the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. As you know, this is one of the great community moments in the, this year. And with the coronavirus, we face a very great challenges for the Muslim communities in Belgium, but also all of in, in, Euro in Europe. As you know, um, Islamophobia is uh, one of the key uh, issues uh, to fight uh, all kinds of racism and uh, discrimination in, uh, in Europe. Um, Islamophobia is now a well-known uh, and accepted term, but it takes very uh, various uh, uh, forms to uh, fight uh, uh, Muslims as a citizens. As you know, it's part of anti-Arabic uh, uh, kind of violence, but also some uh, religious one. The problem with the Islamophobia is the racialization of the Muslims. And we know that with the coronavirus, we have a lot of uh, conspiracy speeches, um, not only about Muslim, against Muslim, but also against other minorities, as, as you know. But um, uh, with the coronavirus, what we uh, face now in uh, Belgium is uh, the increase of hate speech in the uh, internet and also in uh, uh, social networks. It's a very huge concern for us. And we know that it fuels the, the act of violence against uh, people, Muslims, or uh, perceived as Muslims. Another element uh, with the coronavirus period is uh, what we called 
during the lockdown events, some uh, police aggression. We uh, noticed some uh, specific event, uh, specifically targeting the young Muslim people. And um, if we know that uh, um, citizens should respect the police, we know also that uh, citizens should be respected by the police. And we need to build this uh, mutual respect between the police and the, the citizens. Um, uh, we have the situation specifically of uh, Adil, it was a young Muslim um, uh, which uh, will be uh, killed in Belgium after a police uh, uh, control. Um, Again, uh, for this situation, uh, we would like also to underline that uh, the question of Islamophobia is linked to the question of uh, migrants. And uh, we know that there is some uh, specific event in a local level. Um, we need to protect all uh, people uh, against this uh, coronavirus contamination. And we know that some local authorities um, hide the problem of illegal people and uh, try to uh, explain that uh, these, these people didn't exist in our, uh, in our country. I think if we need to build the strong solidarities facing together the coronavirus contamination, we need to consider all human beings as a human being and we need to protect all of them on the same way. Uh, another element uh, uh, about the Islamophobia specifically is this um, mainstream uh, consideration to present uh, the Muslim as a problem in the public debate. And uh, we know that the far right movement and also the xenophobic one spent a lot of time and a lot of energy to uh, build this link between the problem we face in the society and the Muslim communities. It is for us a very great challenge to monitor uh, to uh, the production of these speeches from the far right movement because it uh, uh, fuel in the mentality of the European citizens this uh, very big problem, um, key element linked with the Muslim communities. Um, what I would like also to underline is uh, that uh, we work now um, from several months uh, in a European level to have a working definition of Islamophobia. And I think uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Tomaso, the Euro European coordinator uh, fighting Islamophobia for uh, his huge support to help us to construct this uh, working definition. And I think that we need to share this definition with all uh, the organization in Europe, uh, specifically uh, in this time of coronavirus, uh, it's very helpful to um, work together to fight all this kind of uh, violence. Um, the last element I would like to underline for this point is that uh, forms of racism should be addressed politically with the equal attention. Uh, we know that there is a specific histories. We know that there is specific issue with the several areas in Europe. Uh, for example, in the south of Europe, the, the question is very linked to the migration, but you know also that in France and Belgium, um, we have specific issue about the secularism understanding, and um, uh, we need to uh, uh, not build the competition between the racialized group, but we need to stay united, uh, tackling all kinds of violence, working together with this um, um, uh, mutual understanding, but also with this common European value we share. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ajib. Thank you for sharing. And uh, it, is, it is really um, impressive to hear that uh, one of your main messages, there are so many important messages that we hear from you today, but one is uh, about the solidarity and about um, uh, um, mitigating basically this uh, uh, segregationist approach towards um, 
towards the institutional responses uh, when it comes to different forms of racism in different communities. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now introduce uh, uh, Michael Benhamu. Michael is founder and analyst at Aron Praxis, if I pronounce well, correct, uh, if not, please correct me. Uh, this is a digital advisory for public organizations. And Michael has special interest in looking at antisemitism as well as designing digital tools to understand discrimination. Uh, Michael, please have the floor. Thanks a lot for this uh, introduction. And uh, it's really a chance uh, to be talking at this panel. So I will try to uh, detail the, the, what COVID means uh, for Jews uh, in Europe and across the world. Uh, there were uh, 15 million Jews in Europe in the 1930s. Uh, and of course, the community has now a different, uh, a different uh, overview. Only 1 million, a little bit above 1 million is left in Europe. Uh, close to 6.5 are in Israel and 6 million are in America. Um, this virus has affected uh, Jews, I think, a bit more than average uh, because, um, as you know, this community is quite uh, urban. It is very mobile, uh, very much involved in the service uh, uh, industry. Uh, and also the Jewish diaspora is even more hit, I would say, than Israelis because of its older age structure. Uh, in Israel, uh, there is 15% of Israelis above 65 years old, 15%. In the Jewish diaspora, it is much, much above that. For example, in Germany, 50, 40% uh, of Jews are above uh, 65 and 25% and uh, in the UK uh, are above uh, 65. And we know that this virus is uh, is hard uh, for this age group. Um, as many people said, uh, there is a lot of anti-Semitic content uh, amidst conspiracy theories. We have uh, observed this in the US, in France, in Germany, in Iran, in Yemen. Um, the question is uh, how much of it is anti-Semitic? Uh, it is, of course, at this stage difficult to, to say. We also do not know how these uh, anti-Semitic uh, theories are circulating, but we know, uh, and what we know from, from academia and also from the, the FRA and ODHR, for instance, is that there is a direct link between online hatred and physical acts of violence, uh, and especially, uh, especially for, uh, for Jews. Uh, so, as many people said, there is a need for more studies, more granular uh, studies, uh, and I will push for two small ideas uh, at this panel, um, and, and especially for Commissioner Daly and also for the director of FRA. Uh, two things. I think what would be great uh, uh, for the surveys that you're about to do to measure anti-Semitism is to have these surveys at not two level, at regional level. Uh, so that we know uh, what anti-Semitism means on the ground at the regional level. Uh, so as uh, organizations, uh, you know, Jewish organizations, Black organizations, Roma organizations can actually engage better and target areas where there is a lot of uh, prejudice. Uh, that would be a great, I think, a great asset for uh, human rights organizations and, and also Jewish organizations. So this is my number one point. My, my second point uh, would be about digital racism and digital anti-Semitism. Um, maybe building new AI, you know, artificial intelligence tools uh, to understand the circulation of content on the internet. For example, on Twitter, which we know is a venue for, for such a rhetoric. And, and of course, not to track people. I mean, it's not about uh, no, no, not about you know, trying to watch what they think, but really um, uh, try to understand uh, where there is prejudice and so that we can afterwards, uh, you know, go there with conferences, with talks, uh, um, go to towns, small towns even, and, and try to uh, counter the narrative that is very much present uh, in these areas. 
uh, that would be it for me. I'm trying to to be to be short. Um, it's been a, a long discussion already, and I want to thank again the organizers for for these great events. Thank you. Um, thank you to to all of you for your very substantive interventions. Um, I will attempt to to do a bit of a summary of some of the main points, and I think also the threads that we could see through all the interventions that you had. Um, something that we see repeatedly is the um, framing of minorities as an issue and indeed the scapegoating of minorities. Um, also the position of minorities as um, victims in a sense without looking at them also as partners, as uh, communities that can have positive contributions. Um, Another um, overarching theme has been extremism in the political spectrum. Uh, there have been a lot of mentions of, um, of uh, far right uh, xenophobia. I would also mention um, extremism on the left. Um, access to resources, also a problem that we see throughout the communities. And then very importantly, the online sphere, um, which I think is uh, is, a topic that is very high on the agenda of the commission currently. And I think it would be important to um, look at this human rights component and um, find more creative solutions than currently exist to address this. There is a lot being done on illegal content, but less solutions that we see so far on legal uh, hateful content. So I think that would be very interesting to explore further. One last mention is that virtually all of you have mentioned solidarity as a very important component. So I hope this discussion can be one step in that direction. Um, at this point, I think it would be interesting to bring back in Commissioner Dali and Director of Flaherty to hear a short reflection from them on what has been said. And then we will return to the civil society panelists for some closing remarks. So um, Commissioner Dali, if you are able to hear us. Yeah, and MEP Gonzalez as well. So let's start with Commissioner Dali, then Director of Flatry, and then uh, MEP Gonzalez. Commissioner Dali, uh, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, I, I want to really thank you for, for this dialogue and this important conversation highlighting um, the hardship that ethnic uh, minorities are experiencing at the, at the national and the regional uh, level. The information uh, received uh, during uh, the contributions, which, which we heard this morning, it, it tallies with the information that I receive in other meetings that, that I have had with, with parliamentarians and with civil society in, in general. So I, I take this opportunity to reiterate that, that the EU has, has very thorough legal standards on race and ethnic origin through the Race Equality Directive of 2000 and the framework decision on, on combating certain forms and expressions of racism and xenophobia in, of 20, 2008. So we shall not shy away from taking the appropriate action when these standards are not um, uh, respected as we have done in, in the past. And I want to take a leaf out of uh, what Michael O'Flaherty said in that at decision-making level, um, there should be also the human rights uh, perspective, not just the economic and, you know, it's very, very important. And to, to this end, I, I can speak about um, the, the task force, which we have uh, set up, whereby we are mainstreaming equality in, in all areas of policy, whether it's economic policy, whether it's environmental policy, whether it's health policy. So in, in all areas, um, there is a person, an expert on equality 
uh, which is looking at the legislation, at the policy, whatever it is that is being formulated from the equality um, perspective. So, so Michael, we're on the same page there and I agree totally uh, because many times what happens is that, that when this perspective is not put in, then it, sometimes it is too late and when, when we realize what has been left out, so it's better to be there uh, at the outset, uh, where, where the plans are, are being made, where the discussions are, are being made. Uh, so thank you for that point. And then I reiterate my commitment to, to continue to hold meetings and gather information from parliamentarians and from civil society and to engage with you to address racism and discrimination against religious communities. It is our role to protect citizens, regardless of their race or ethnic origin, as well as their religion or belief against uh, discrimination. So, so this, is, this, this uh, um, seminar is, is, is very important that, 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 you, that you held it, that we have um, brought our, our ideas together from the COVID experience. Uh, we, we are learning uh, a lot from this experience and what we are learning, as I said earlier, will be fed into, into our future um, policies. Um, but as ever, I remain available to you. My door is always open and please let's, let's carry on with this conversation because uh, the members of civil society are close to the persons which they represent. So there is a wealth of, of information which we can get there. Also the parliamentarians who, who represent their uh, constituents and they, and they have their hand on, on the pulse of, of these people, of, the, of their experiences. For they, so they are our allies uh, who can bring us all these, these uh, hands-on information because, because the parliamentarians are in the field working with, with citizens and listening to their constituents. So let's keep this exercise uh, going. And, and you have my word that uh, I will do anything which is within my, my power to, to uh, eradicate discrimination and hate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Dali. Thank you for reiterating your support and your, your engagement. Um, and I think always the work is on the implementation side. And um, I think that is where most of the difficulty is, translating European directives to actual action on the ground. So um, I think we're all, we, are, we are all um, in our daily work um, very focused on making sure that the national level implementation is working smoothly and we hope to work together in the future to see that happen. Um, Director of Flarty, I give the floor to you if you'd like to reflect on anything that was said. Sure, yeah, I'd like to, uh, uh, just a few disparate items if you don't mind. Uh, first, uh, Michael made two suggestions right there at the end and I'd like to come back to them. The first was the suggestion that when we do survey work, that we be able to get down to the local level to identify not just national situations, but uh, local and regional ones. We can already do that to some extent with fundamental rights agency surveys. You can go sub-national with some of our surveys and you can navigate your way to uh, that way of reading our surveys on our website. But uh, one of the uh, downsides of working remotely is that I don't have my expert colleagues around me right now. But what I promise is that I'll ask them to be in touch with you directly with the information. And your point is well taken. It makes sense. Um, secondly, on, um, on tracking hate. It's not the word you use, but that's how I heard it. It's a very interesting idea. Um, right now, of course, we're very concerned with human rights compliance of tracking infection. Uh, and some of the similar issues arise. But in May, in the May edition of our COVID bulletin, uh, the primary focus, the thematic focus will be on tracking apps and their compliance with, with human and fundamental rights. And I'm going to bring your suggestion back to the colleagues uh, to see uh, if it's something that we could explore. So thank you again there for that interesting suggestion. Um, now, turning to the more general discussion, um, I was struck by many things, but there's there was an immediate relevance for me and for this agency in the discussion of age. 
Um, I have to say I was struck in the first place when I was reminded that uh, the category of older person when you're speaking about Roma has to be 45. Uh, this is, it is an important re reminder uh, which we have to take into account. And also, I think it was important to be reminded that demographics mean that the older component of a community can take on far greater significance uh, from one group to another. Uh, and the point made about the demographics of the Jewish community in Europe was an important one. Uh, why is it of immediate relevance for us? Uh, well, that's because the thematic focus of our bulletin in June will be uh, COVID-19, human rights and older people. And these dimensions and others will be taken into account. Um, then, uh, I, if you'll allow me, just make a, a rather personal observation. Uh, and I understand completely why the focus today has been on what the EU can do, what the EU should do. Uh, if I were in civil society, I would frame our remarks in exactly the same way. But if you're in my job, uh, and I'm, sh I'm sure Commissioner Daly has a similar experience, we're struck by the extent to which responses to the pandemic are issues of national competence. And so many of the answers that we're looking for across a wide range of the problems, including many discussed today, are primarily uh, to be found at national capitals rather than in Brussels. And I'm not in any way suggesting an, an improper focus today, but the need for a, um, a parallel focus at national levels. It's critically important. Uh, and the uh, final thing I'd say is uh, I, want to, um, I want to thank Alina. Thank you so very much. You talked about today's event as a demonstration of solidarity. I think it is. I think it's, it's, it's valuable and until six weeks ago, rather unusual. Uh, but uh, this is a better way of working in many cases. This is a way to bring the, let's call them the unofficial or civil society and the official worlds into a dialogue uh, in a way that's more focused maybe a bit deeper than it, is, it might otherwise be the case. So I hope that you and, 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 and all the other participants will explore how we can continue to use this form of solidarity in the coming weeks, but also when we get back to whatever the new normal will look like. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for finishing on this uplifting tone and with this uplifting message. Um, let me now give the floor to NAP Gonzalez. Thank you. A more short uh, intervention, uh, but my English is very, very bad. Uh, thank you, especially to the Commissioner Elena, Elena Dali for participating in, in all events and um, for, for her work. Uh, we welcome the, the commitment to, to present the strategy on the Roman people uh, until finish this, this year. It's, it's very, very important uh, the Commission present this uh, strategy, uh, our, uh, as well as making this uh, structural plan uh, more flexibly, uh, which made it possible to increase uh, the hate program uh, for vulnerability growth. Uh, thank you for all participating. Thank you, uh, Mr. Flaherty. Uh, and thank you especially, especially uh, to Delena and, and, and Alina for coordinating this event. It is important. Uh, I, I think it's, it's very important to monitor the network in the conf confinement uh, time that coincides with uh, Ramadan. Uh, if it's, if it's you good to you, uh, we will close this conference and remain uh, at your disposal for for other other events. Thank you, thank you very much, and I'm sorry my my English very very bad. Not at all. English is always beautiful with an accent. Thank you very much um, for your remarks, and I think it's only fitting to um, finish the panel with. Uh, remarks from civil society. So I would ask each panelist just to give us in one sentence, so very condensed, um, one message that you would like to leave um, our public with, which is a mixture of uh, policy makers, civil society, but also uh, just regular folks who are interested in the topic and may want to make a positive impact in this period. So. Um, we can go ahead and start with Hajib. 
Thank you. Then uh, with the European Network Against Racism, uh, we call for the European Union standards for the National Action Plan Against Racism to encourage the member state to adopt a comprehensive anti-racism policies addressing all forms of racism. And we also ensure Islamophobia is mainstreamed in key European Union policy areas, such as the gender equality strategy. And for the positive point, uh, we uh, see wonderful solidarity facing together the coronavirus pandemic. Muslim communities are part of the world society and we found them in the first line assistance and support of coronavirus victims. We celebrate our fundamental European values, solidarity mm -hmm. and hospitality. Then my message is uh, to put uh, more energy to fight discrimination that we would like to put them to build an inclusive society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hajib. Um, I still see Isabella on the screen. I don't know if she is there. If she is, she can just unmute herself. Uh, but in the meantime, let me give the floor to Omar for your concluding remark. Yes. Um uh i think that uh yeah thank you to all for your for your pertinent remarks and uh and idea and ins insights uh i just want to add the one thing addressed to mr flaherty and uh also to the commissioner dali to say that uh if we we it's a long time it's a long time demand uh, to conduct uh, studies and research uh for data by civil society and i think that we um i think that uh, the civil society needs more resources national from national also but also from the european union and i hope that the commissioner Dali will uh, will take this into account and to give the different civil societies more resources to conduct their own research so that they can have more arguments and more proofs of things that they know uh just to close is to say that um, in a, in a good african proverb they say that a, for, a tree that falls makes a lot of noise a forest that grows grows in silence and I think that um, there, are, there are many things uh, that we could say about ourselves, but uh, I am also glad to see that there is mobilization. There is mobilization, there is awareness. Uh, people realize that there are issues and they want to tackle it. And there are efforts being made to do so uh, from civil society, from some institutions, from some uh, MIPs, from some commissioners and, uh, and different actors in the, in the society. So we have to count on that. And the future is not only what comes upon us, but it's what we together do uh, to, to, to shape that future. So let's shape a Europe that is inclusive. Let's shape a Europe where there is no uh, racism, where let's shape a Europe where exclusion do not have a place. And I forgot in my beginning remarks to say that uh, I forgot to name the Asian communities. They were the, the I mean, the first, the first uh, uh, racist attacks during COVID-19 was mostly addressed to them, physical attacks. And, uh, and they were suffering from this. And I think that we should not forget that. And we should uh, remember and, and also voice it because uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, by touching to anybody, you're touching all of us. So, and, uh, and this is what Europe should, should mean. And thank you, Alina and Jelena for organizing this. Uh, thank you for all the participants. Uh, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to the next initiatives and I'm looking forward to measures. And we are continuing our struggle at the local level, at the regional level, at the national level, at the European level, but also at the global level. And I, I want to remind all of you, this decade is also a decade of people of African descent at the global level, where we are addressing and insisting on the issues that people of African descent are facing. And uh, I hope that, uh, uh, that you all will try to know more about it and support our struggle uh, for more work on, for, for more um, for more uh, reconnaissance and also uh, for change uh, of the condition in which uh, people of African descent have been living for too much long time. Thank you very much, Omar, for your remarks. Um, Isabella, shall we go to you? Uh, yes, I'm sorry I have to leave in the in the meantime, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm still here so I came back. Um, I guess your question is for final words, right? Um, okay, right. I think the most important takeaway for us as civil society and for Ergo Network is that indeed racialized minorities are not left behind. Either it, when we both when we speak about 
the immediate responses to the pandemic, but also to really addressing the structural problems that Roma communities particularly have. Um, what the pandemic, pandemic uh, has done so far is to basically make more visible something that was already existing there for the last decade, which is deplorable living conditions, lack of infrastructures, and, leave, and really a, an immense social exclusion of Roma. So the lessons learned from this is that unless we start today to address these structural issues, we are not going to make headways as, as societies at all. So really, again, the last point would be that the framework strategy on Roma should not be delayed um, in the context where we speak about emergency issues to address just the pandemic. We have to address the structural issues that our societies are having, which are related to racism and social exclusion. Whether we speak about Roma, whether we speak about Black communities, whether we speak about Jewish communities, or whether we speak about Muslims throughout Europe. So it's really important to prioritize fundamental rights and the protections of rights of everybody else, particularly the most vulnerable. So that would be the takeaway to prioritize. Thank you, Isabella, very much. Uh, and thank you for staying with us until the end, eventually. Uh, Michael? Thanks, Elina. I will be uh, quite fast. Um, thank you, Mr. O'Flaherty, for um, uh, responding to, to me. I will just um, say again that the more regional data is, uh, the better we civil society can engage on the ground by choosing the towns where prejudice is, uh, is, is higher than in other uh, places. Um, I don't know that FRA is doing this kind of not two level regional work, but I know that Eurobarometer is doing that kind of uh, that kind of work already so maybe that would be interesting to take some inspiration from uh, from uh, your your barometer but already what i what i want to say is is you know to thank what fra is doing uh what the commissioner is doing uh, already on the ground and uh, and with all of us and uh, and thanks again uh, alina for uh, for bringing us together thank you Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, indeed, thank you to, to all the wonderful speakers um, from my side, MEPs Gonzalez in France, Commissioner Dali, Director of Flarty, um, and most of all, Isabella, Hajib, Omar, and Michael, um, really for, for sharing so, so many insights from your experience on the ground and um, responses that have been developed so far but most importantly for uh, reinforcing this message of solidarity. As Isabella said uh, earlier, very pertinently, hopefully this crisis will bring us closer together and not further apart. And I think this is a beautiful step in that direction. Um, a big, big thank you to, to Ardi and to Yelena for partnering with the event and for all the work um, that that you did to make it happen. And also a shout out to my colleague Ilan uh, for all the help he's been offering in the background. Uh, so before I pass it on to, to Yelena to uh, offer her closing remarks, to everyone watching, thank you very much. On behalf of Neighbors, it's been uh, wonderful to, to have you. Stay safe and I hope we can meet in person very soon. Thank you, thank you, Alina, very much. I would also like to thank uh, everybody uh, who participated and also to our listeners, to those who joined uh, Facebook and uh, who registered. Uh, I would also just like to mention that uh, it is very unfortunate that we got questions, uh, but we didn't have time to answer. So I would like to just ensure also those who are listening that we will definitely seriously <laughs> take this into account by remembering uh, your specific questions and uh, using also these questions for our next um, event. And we will forward these questions uh, that were mostly uh, directed to Commissioner Dali. Uh, I, would, uh, I would also like to thank um, MFPs Gonzalez and uh, Mr. Franz and uh, Mr. Flaherty, I would also like to say that uh, to thank you for, especially for your incentive to, uh, to strengthen, actually for your uh, 
yeah, for, for you strengthening our incentive to continue with this work and to put all the actors together in uh, whatever context is given to us. Uh, thank you very much once more, and especially Alina, um, for this smooth and inspiring uh, cooperation. And also special thanks goes to our colleague Elan for the, for the te technical support. I wish you all a very nice uh, rest of the day. And uh, I hope you enjoy the, uh, our discussion and you find it very useful. Thank you.